Welcome on. Yeah, really it's great to see uh, so many in person on Zoom. So I'm Cindy Amy, which is this is our second uh, Wednesday seminar of the academic year for population, family, and reproductive health. So very excited to get to share with you some stories from some other faculty that we didn't hear from last time. Um, with that, I'm going to ask Cindy uh, to come up and join us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice to see you here. I'm Saifuddin Ahmed, professor in the Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health with a joint appointment in the biostatistics. Just like many of you, one day I landed here as a student. Okay? And now I'm still here. Let's see that. I like this place so much, I could not leave. But I'm still here. Now, we know that this is great to be at the best school. We call it Hopkins is the best public at this school. I don't believe that. I don't believe that Hopkins is the best public at this school. It would be possible without you. And Hopkins is the best school because of you. And that's, I think, when I come every day, that the pride I have, that I have the opportunity to interact with the best of the best in the world, in the intellectual world. Now, my background, I started as a physician, and then come here, you may not know, PFRH department is essentially composition of the two departments. We have two departments, essentially, population dynamics and maternal and child health. And the population dynamics and the maternal and child department combined to become the PFRH. And I was in the, uh, that uh, population dynamic department. And at that time, we have the so called, uh, we have to take a minor, and I took minor as an epidemiologist. So I have a demographic background, epidemiology background, and I teach statistics now. Now, as a physician, to tell very frankly, I really miss my patients. So when I really feel like that, now I have a student, <laughs> but think about that way. The patient comes with the problem, and as a physician, we really like to address that problem. The students are not coming with the problem. So who work? Basically, when I really see the student, I really see them as an explorer, knowledge explorer, right? If you think about uh, Ernest uh, Shackleton, who explored with the um, so I really feel like that you are the explorer, and essentially, I'm a passenger of that endurance ship. And I really like to see that I'm essentially as a faculty, or we all as a faculty essentially part of that ship, and we're really helping you. You are the captain. We are essentially the part of that ship. Now, how do you really come to the so-called maternal and childhood? I primarily work in the maternal and childhood. As a physician, I was working in Iran. You may be surprised, right? Exactly, I was working in the Iran. And one day I was waiting in my, uh, I was seeing the patients and we have a one pregnant woman come for the delivery. And it was a small hospital. We did not have the opportunity for uh, conducting any cesarean section. And she developed uh, obstructed labor. And essentially we suggested that the husband or the family she must be transferred to a referral hospital. And husband said, no, if the one child gone, another child will come. I don't like to see a scar on the belly of my wife. Now just think about that way, right? This is sometimes it is some sort of like, when I really see the women, I feel like that they have a so-called the choice without the voice. They do not have the voice or no choice or no voice. They do not even have a choice of the voice. But eventually, uh, almost like a one hour I sat, I mean, frequently I talked to the husband and I convinced him and essentially then he was some sort of like a convinced and taken that woman to the referral hospital. And I completely forgot about that, that husband or that uh, woman. After seven or eight days, I said that somebody is knocking at my chamber and essentially that husband appeared and he come, essentially came to say that, okay, 
I really came to thank you that you have convinced me to go to the hospital and my daughter is alive and my wife is alive. And that really gave me a lot of pleasure, you know? I mean, so I really feel like that I was able to convince someone and I really saved a life or say two lives, you can think about that way. So in public health, I really exactly feel like that. Okay? When you are working, you are really not, we say that okay, we are saving mil millions at a time. So I think that's essentially the great pleasure we have as a public health. So we are not saving one or two lives, we are really saving millions and millions lives to this public health. And that's essentially the essence. I started my career with the family planning. Uh, most of my, I, 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 I'm originally from Bangladesh. I didn't know at that time, Bangladesh was doing a lot of family planning programs. So most of my work, early work was the family planning that essentially led me to the Hopkins. Uh, and um, very interestingly also, uh, my career in public health was really not uh, by choice, some sort of like an accidental. But what is the meaning of accidental? So I returned from Iran, and um, at that time, around 88, around that time, I had the affordability to buy a computer and I became very hooked up with the computer. And I was really doing a lot of good things with the computer. And someday one organization really called me and said they can really help them in some sort of like a statistical type of analysis. But I did not know anything about the statistics at that time. But I knew computers. So somehow I was able to help them and they were talking, and they really thought that I'm an engineer because uh, of my expertise in the computer. And that individual really find out or some sort of way they're talking about the side effects of the contraceptive. And I was very eagerly participated in the conversation because I knew the side effects of the contraceptive. And suddenly he asked me that how as an engineer, you know the side effects. I said, no, I'm not an engineer. I'm a basically a physician. And he was very surprised. He came from the US to that organization. It's a small NGO. And that organization basically asked me, they can you really work with them? And I joined that organization. And I really said, wow. As a physician, to tell you very frankly, when I was growing in Bangladesh, public health was not really very attractive. They said, we really call it like a community medicine. Right? So it was not really the public health as you know here now. It was not like that way. So, but I said, wow, it's great, right? From, that's the way I really shift from the so the clinical side to the public health. And I really like, I really feel like that, okay, this is, and you can see that how much I'm contemplated with this public health that I really cannot express. And I really have really, have really satisfied at this stage, I say, I say down here, uh, I missed my patient but I never see the students my passion, but I really see as my, some sort of, a, I'm a part of their knowledge journey and I'm really, it's a great journey and it's a great job to be with you. Thank you. Hi everybody. And I'm sorry, I can't be there in person today, um, but I'm gonna to talk to you about a story that I don't think I've presented at one of these seminars yet. And that's um, a more personal story related to my own experience during pregnancy and how it shapes a lot of my work that I do around um, maternal health and perinatal health. And essentially, so I had my first pregnancy, everything was going really well. You know, I'm attending my prenatal appointments, um, following guidelines, and I get to delivery and get to my delivery room, things are going well, and the nurses are there. And all of a sudden I feel something and the nurses look at each other and I can just tell, hmm, something's probably going wrong. Um, eventually the OBGYN comes in. She says, you know, you're bleeding a lot more than we would like. And we're gonna insert um, a fetal monitor to check on, you know, the, your fetus to make sure that they're okay. Um, so that's going okay, everything's fine. I'm hearing the monitor in the back. And all of a sudden the monitors, beeping in a weird way. And I look at my mom who's in the room with me and I said, oh, should I get the nurse? And before I press the call button, a swarm of people come inside or come into the room and rush me to the OR. And so it was really interesting for me, right? Because I, I, at that time I was studying maternal health and here I was about to become a statistic. 
Um, so needless to say, I'm fine. I had, oh, well, actually one, one interesting part is I'm in the OR and the OBGYN goes, okay, so the fetus is, or, you know, is stable or baby, I guess she said, do you want me to operate or do you want to just wait? We can just wait too. And I was like, why are you asking me? You're the expert. Um, and I said, operate, I guess. And, um, and at the end, she's like, I'm glad you said operate. So anyway, um, I was like, you're the expert. Uh, so everything was fine. Um, but how does this relate to the way that I think about my research? Well, first of all, I, I think a lot about what caused what I had. Oh, and so what I had was a placental abruption, which is when the placenta detaches from the wall of the uterus um, before delivery, and it causes um, or it deprives the um, fetus of oxygen. So there's concern for the fetus, but for the mom, it can cause really heavy bleeding, which is what I had. Um, so I think about the risk factors that are associated with placental abruption because I have my research hat on. I'm like, okay, hypertension, uh, uh, car accident, cocaine use. Um, right, I'm trying to figure out what's going wrong. And even the, in the postpartum uh, ward, they go, you know, have you ever used drugs? Have you used cocaine? And no. So it makes me think about how we really don't understand the causes of all um, maternal health complications and perinatal health complications. To this day, we don't exactly know what causes preterm birth, right? So for me, it, it engendered this sense of humility and that we really don't know a lot. These, these conditions are really understudied. Maternal health has been traditionally understudied. Um, but also, um, it also made me think of how our framings of individual behaviors, like what did the mom eat? What did the mom, did the mom exercise, right? It also turns into the story of maternal blame or, preg or blaming pregnant people for something that they did during pregnancy. And I wanna step away from that framing. I wanna think more about the social, the structural factors that maybe shape women's behaviors or pregnant people's behaviors. So that's a lot of what I think about. Um, the second thing is that I became a statistic that day. And so whenever I look at my data, I think of those lines in my data that represent individual people. And I think about their stories that are that are not captured on those lines. There's a lot of variables we don't measure. And um, I just try to, to you know, it, just not think of things in terms of numbers, but actually in terms of people. Um, and then last um, is that, that that experience that I had was very traumatic. And I had no support afterward to deal with that trauma. And I'm a pretty, you know, well-resourced person, a privileged person. And so it just made me think of all the gaps in what in what the postpartum experience, and especially in regards to trauma, while trying to, of course, take care of an, a new uh, infant. Um, so I, although I don't do a lot of work in the postpartum space, it just I, I just hope for more of it because um, it was very clear that there was a lot of um, interventions that were missing at that time. So um, that's my story for today. Uh, I know it was kind of personal, but I thought I would share it. And I'm so glad you guys are all here. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing how you guys will all advance uh, maternal child women's health throughout the life course. So uh, thanks. Hi, everyone. I am Erin Hager, and I'm an associate professor here in the department. I'm going to spend my five minutes, and I realized I forgot my timer, so I, I am right at five minutes, um, telling you a little bit about me. I'm going to introduce my team and then give you a brief anecdote on what excites me about public health. So a bit about me. I am a proud, lifelong Baltimorean. I was born in Baltimore City. I grew up in Violetville. If anyone's familiar with it, we uh, then moved to Arbutus, which is in Baltimore County, where my parents still live. Uh, for the other Baltimoreans in the room, my answer is Lansdowne High School. So if you don't know what that means, the uh, Baltimoreans can explain it later. Um, I went to Loyola College, which is also in Baltimore. And then I got my PhD here uh, at the, in the Department of International Health and Human Nutrition, which of course is in Baltimore. And then I uh, got my first faculty position soon after graduating at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, which is also in Baltimore, <laughs> the other side of town. Um, and during that time, we, along with my amazing team, who you'll meet in a minute, spent 13 years building a strong research program to promote children's healthy growth and development and prevent family food insecurity, focusing on where kids live, work, and play. So we worked in homes, communities, and schools. And we do this through research on practices and or research on practices and programs. 
So then this past April, just a few months ago, our research team moved here back to the School of Public Health, which of course is in Baltimore. And uh, so I clearly have very deep roots here and I just feel very lucky to have been able to stay in my hometown for so long and be able to really dedicate my research to a community that means a lot to me. So now I'm going to introduce you to my team, some of whom are on Zoom, some are in the room. Um, we have a team with a ton of skills with respect to project coordination, quantitative and qualitative data collection and management, dissemination of research findings. I could go on and on. They're just an incredibly talented group of folks. Um, and I asked them to uh, put their cameras on if they could on Zoom, but first names only uh, Rachel, Raquel, Dipti, Helena, Nan, I know is here in the room, uh, Jannie and Joyce are all folks that we've been working with while we've been here. Um, we have lots of uh, opportunities for internships and volunteer opportunities, some paid opportunities as well. We have a website, it's MarylandSchoolWellness.org. So if you're interested in finding out more about what we do, you can go there. And we're here a lot. So we have our doors open, come by, say hi. We would love to get to know everybody a little bit better. So I think I have about two minutes to tell you my anecdote on the thing that gets me the most jazz about public health. Um, and that is really the translation of research into policy and practice. So I'm a big believer in that we should be practicing what we preach. Um, I like getting my hands dirty and working with service organizations as much as I can. Um, people have told me over the years I do too much service, but I really like it. And so it's uh, hard to say no sometimes. I do try to identify service opportunities that link to my own expertise and skills so that I can try to genuinely be helpful to other organizations while also learning about what's happening at the ground level. So some of the more school relevant things that I do is I uh, co-chair a CDC working group on school wellness. I serve on both the Baltimore City and Baltimore County School Health Councils, and I chair the State School Health Council. I do other non-school things too, but those are just some, some school things that I do. Um, so being able to see the research and practice sides of things has always been very exciting, but the one thing I never got to do was really see how policies were made. And so uh, in January of 2020, I applied for a governor appointed position to the Baltimore County School Board. So I have three kids in Baltimore County Schools. I went to Baltimore County Schools um, and I'm very interested in school policy. And so I figured I'd put my hat in the ring. And um, about a month after the start of the pandemic, I found out that they picked me, which I was very surprised about. And so now I have served on the school board for about two and a half years and my term is coming to an end. And so the specific very brief story I wanted to mention is that um, one of the things I'm most proud of is that we were able to expand the county's enrollment in something called the Community Eligibility Provision. So we're called CEP, which is a USDA program that allows for individual schools or whole districts that serve predominantly low-income communities determined through administrative data. So not individual family forms, but looking at the community as a whole. And if uh, they're eligible for CEP, then, then every kid in the whole school can get free lunch and breakfast. And so about two months into my board position, I reached out to colleagues who study CEP, including my friend Susan, who has done a lot of work in this area, and other advocacy groups that I had met through all my other service opportunities. And together we, um, we gathered data and information, and I made my very first motion which was to expand CEP to all eligible schools and it ended up passing unanimously. And so we were able to get CEP from being in only four schools in Baltimore County to 87. So it was a huge expansion. And so to be on that policy making side of the, the table was really, really cool. However, <laughs> so doing this for two and a half years now, it really has affirmed to me that my heart is really in research. And so I will be stepping down in November and sticking to my day job. Um, but I definitely have, have learned a lot through this process, and I, I think that that translation is really kind of the most exciting part of my job in public health. So that's it. Hello. Uh, my name is Ann Lilly. Uh, I'm a research associate in our department. Um, it's funny, I think alphabetically I follow you, but also thematically <laughs> I follow you. So we'll see some, some similar themes. Um, so currently I'm a research associate in the department. Um, I, my family actually moved to Baltimore when I was five. Um, so also a huge Baltimore proponent here. Um, and I have been boomeranging in and out of Baltimore my whole life. Um, so for college, I went to the University of Virginia. Wahoo wah. Thank you, Thomas Jefferson. And there I was a biochem and history double major. I was also really into, his, uh, into service um, and just serving the community. I was in a tutoring program, and then I came to lead that whole tutoring program um, when I was in my last year of college. And I, at that point, as a 
21 year old. Um, I was really of the opinion that quality education was sort of a silver bullet um, that to help kids meet what they wanted to meet in their lives. We just needed to get them to a quality school. Maybe they need some additional supports, but the education was really the way to go. <clears throat> so I went to South Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer, served there for just over two years um, in a village called Glen Red, um, which was very rural. Um, it's about six hours from Johannesburg, two hours from the nearest town on a gravel road. Um, so definitely rural, definitely a low income community. And there I worked at two schools, an elementary, middle, and a high school, and did like literacy activities, numeracy, stuff like that. And one of the things that I realized in working with kids, um, like I said, I had this whole education silver bullet thesis, um, but working with kids and seeing them come to school every day, it made me think a lot about what happened before school. So I mean that in two senses, actually. Um, so we have the before school of what happened the night before? What happened that morning? Did they have breakfast? Are there story times in their family? What kind of literacy things are happening? What kind of health things are happening? Um, but in the second sense, you know, what happens before school? A lot happens in a kid's life before they enter school. Um, you know, there's a prenatal period. There's that whole period before they even enter kindergarten. So I became more and more interested in what I would later come to learn were social determinants of health. Um, and what happens at home really matters. Um, so that led me to public health. Um, I came here in 2011 um, to get my master's in the science of public health. Um, I am a child of this population family family. <laughs> um, and in that time, I got to work with Ian Duggan um, and also Kay O'Neill and um, learning really about these programs that serve families with young children. Um, and how can we support families to support their children? And I had worked in a school in Peace Corps. I was still mesmerized by schools. I think schools are magical places. Um, so much is possible there. Um, they touch so many kids every day. There's so much potential to support children well um, in that K-12 environment. So with that mesmerization, um, I went to work at city schools here in Baltimore um, on North Ave. I worked in the central office, um, basically doing reporting. Um, so we reported to the school board, we reported to the public. Um, we also did small program evaluation projects within the district. Um, and then in 2015, I returned to our department um, and returned to the team with Ann Duggan, got to collaborate with Lori Burrell, um, really on these early childhood programs um, in New Jersey. So basically since that point, I've gone deep on New Jersey. And um, I now manage RTU's full suite of projects um, in the state of New Jersey, along with Cynthia um, and our great team up on the fourth floor. And it's cool because we get to do evaluation work and sort of research work, but we're also doing a bunch of applied projects really in quality improvement. Um, so helping partners to build data dashboards, helping people to do quality improvement projects, um, things like that, which is really neat. Um, and then that's me, that's where I am. Uh, before I conclude, I do want to say two things, kind of on Erin's theme here. Just, you know, this is Baltimore. She maybe gets a bad rap, but she's so charming. Um, <laughs> if you take the time to get to know her. <laughs> so we have awesome theaters here, cool museums, great restaurants. Um, so I would encourage you to take the time to get to know who she is. Um, if you want to chat with me, I'm here two days a week in person, Wednesday, Thursday. I'm in E4138, um, right near the North Reading Room. Um, yeah, and I guess I would say great to see all of you in person. Good luck, have a good year. Everyone, I'm Tamar Mendelson. I think I am now unmuted. So welcome everyone. I'm really sorry I can't be there in person today. Um, but I'm excited to tell you a little bit about my story. And first, fun fact, uh, Anne Lily's parents are actually my neighbors. Uh, so I'm on the same block with them. Um, I am a professor uh, with a joint appointment in the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Pop Fam, and I direct the Center for Adolescent Health. 
So I came to population health not on a linear pathway. I was not somebody who knew what I wanted to be growing up. And in college, I majored in humanities, which did not really help with that decision because it was very broad. <laughs> so when I got out of college, I thought, hmm, I'm not sure what to do. I really love uh, reading and I love editing. Why don't I try book publishing? So I went into book publishing and worked at Viking Penguin for a couple of years, um, but it was very different than what I expected. So it was very marketing driven and um, really the Penguin classics do not need editing. So <laughs> there was a lot of different sort of responsibilities than I had thought. And I found that I really missed academics, but that I also really craved to have some uh, a career pathway that would involve more service. Um, and sort of helping to reduce suffering in the world. And so I um, decided on clinical psychology and I got my PhD in clinical psychology. I had never heard of public health, I should say. There was no public health major when I was an undergraduate and it wasn't something on my radar at all. Um, and it wasn't really until my internship that I started to uh, learn more about it. So I uh, did my internship in San Francisco at a public sector hospital, and I was working with clients who had um, really uh, serious structural barriers in their lives and were living in extreme poverty. Uh, many had serious trauma histories. And um, what I found was that the training that I had gotten felt really inadequate to address the kinds of issues that people were facing. And in fact, you know, my, it, it felt kind of offensive in some ways to be doing CBT with folks who, you know, I, I remember a client who had trouble even getting into the clinic because he was homeless and had a um, a shopping cart that wouldn't fit into the, in the elevator, um, and another woman also struggling with homelessness who was um, essentially in danger of for her life and had five children um, that she was caretaking for um, was being pursued by a um, uh, her partner who had been violent towards her and was threatening her. I, I started to think a lot more about social determinants and structural determinants of mental health and also about are there other ways that we can reach folks uh, before they get to the point of needing services for sort of a diagnosed mental health problem? Are there ways that we can meet folks where they're at in the community? Um, in culturally sensitive ways. And so I was really fortunate to work with a mentor who um, was working with prevention programming. I had never even heard the word prevention in graduate school. And so this was really um, a revelation for me. And I got really excited about that idea. Um, and also sort of the need for really hearing from folks with lived experience, the fact that Maybe I'm not the expert on a lot of things. Maybe this expertise um, lives in large part in communities and um, with individuals. So in, with individuals in the community who have lived experience of issues. So that um, changed my pathway. I was able to do an interdisciplinary fellowship where I got exposed to a lot more ideas about population health and interdisciplinary perspectives. And by that point, I had no idea where I would get a job because I wasn't even looking like a traditional clinical psychologist. And I was really fortunate to um, be hired in the Department of Mental Health, which was sort of the unicorn I'd been looking for. It had, um, you know, interdisciplinary perspectives, a focus on prevention and um, an opportunity to really work deeply with Baltimore community members, um, a lot of the work uh, that I've done is around mindfulness and um, mindfulness based interventions to improve student mental health and well being in schools. And ultimately also to work really closely with young people themselves and to engage young people um, through the Center and other partners in you know really thinking about what the solutions should be and helping. Uh, you know helping to engage them as leaders in the process as well so. Just wanted to share a little bit of my story. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Farah Qureshi. I'm a new assistant professor in the department and following uh, the tradition of two folks before me, I'm also a native Baltimorean. <laughs> I um, have been here for most of my life. I did my undergrad at Hopkins. 
Um, I graduated from, uh, from the department here. Uh, I got my MHS in 2010. Um, and after many, many years, I uh, moved to Boston to do my PhD at Harvard. Uh, and I did my postdoc there as well. So I was living up there for almost a decade. Now I'm back. I'm really excited. I couldn't be more happy uh, to have this kind of homecoming. So um, it's great to be here with you all. Um, before I get started, I want to apologize for having notes with me. I have a six-month-old at home, and so I'm like very sleep deprived. <laughs> um, the only way that I routine anything these days is by writing literally everything. <laughs> so, um, anyway, um, what I want to talk about today is the notion of cognitive dissonance, um, because I think that really sitting in it and the discomfort of it and confronting it head on is one of the many things that's motivated my career in public health. Um, so for those of you who are not aware, I'm a social epidemiologist, which means that I study how social inequities get under the skin and shape population patterns of health and disease. Uh, and more specifically, I focus on young people, so children and adolescents, with the aim of disentangling how their early social environments and mental health together shape cardiovascular health disparities across the lifespan. And I do this from a positive youth development asset-based perspective. I'm meaning that I really want to understand uh, what are the positive experiences and resources that young people need to live healthy lives, um, and to what extent are these resources or access to them equitably distributed in society. Um, and as you can imagine, like many folks who work in the child and adolescent space, I often find myself reflecting on my own upbringing and doing this work. And uh, what I can tell you after uh, much reflection for many years is that the undeniable conclusion I've reached time and time again is that I am the product of an unjust system. So I am one of six kids from a large immigrant family. Um, my parents immigrated to Baltimore City. They lived in West Baltimore and they first moved here from Pakistan in 1970. Uh, and when I tell you that my parents poured every single penny that they earned into their kids, it is literally no exaggeration. Uh, so they sent all six of us to private school for 12 years each. Um, and the reason they did this was because they were told when they moved here when they were 22, uh, 22, 23, that the only way their kids could succeed in Baltimore City, um, or even in, in some of the surrounding areas, was if they absolutely did not go to the public schools here. They had to go to the private schools. Um, and so I went to a bougie private school in the county, and I had an incredible K through 12 experience where Basically, every resource that I needed to succeed was handed to me on a silver platter. Um, that's not to say I didn't encounter uh, challenges along the way, as you can imagine, given that scenario. Um, but my parents sacrificed everything. So most notably, any shred of a retirement fund uh, or financial security in old age uh, to pay their way and guarantee their kids a successful and prosperous future. And how are they able to do that? So uh, for those of you who may not be aware, the history of immigration policy in the United States is obviously complicated and ugly. Uh, so in the 60s and 70s, the US opened their borders to immigrants from South Asia um, more widely than they had previously, but only really to professionals. Um, and so if you think of the South Asian folks you know in this country who are really quite established, been here for decades, they generally are doctors, engineers, or some sort of highly educated individual. Um, and so not only was I unfairly advantaged in this country and that I was afforded opportunities that are systematically denied to most young people in America um, by virtue of my family being able to pay their way, uh, but my parents were unfairly advantaged in Pakistan because they were afforded the opportunity to even immigrate here um, because they came from a certain privileged educational background. Uh, so why mention all of this and how does it relate to what brought me to public health um, and what motivates me every day? So this has led me to feel very, very strongly that Every child in this country, and honestly in the world, um, is entitled to have the resources that I had available to me when I was attending the predominantly, or occupying the predominantly white spaces that I've occupied uh, for the majority of my life. Uh, and it shouldn't be something that parents have to sacrifice their entire livelihood to guarantee for their kids. Um, access to these things shouldn't be dictated by how much money you have, the color of your skin, the sound of your name, where you live, your religion, who you love. These are fundamental human rights. Uh, and I believe that our job as public health professionals is not only to help individuals live healthier lives, but to create a more just world. Uh, as long as there are structures in society that prevent children from reaching their full potential and unfairly advantage others, myself and my family included, uh, we will continue to see these same minoritized, marginalized, whatever term you want to use to describe overwhelmingly uh, black and brown kids who face the brunt of these inequities 
uh, continue to live sicker lives and die earlier than their white, more advantaged peers. <clears throat> that notion in and of itself is the fact, and the fact that I've benefited from this unjust system that really needs to be dismantled and reimagined is what brings me through the doors day after day. When I do my work, uh, which can sometimes feel very disconnected from the real world, I use large scale epi data sets where people are often just zeros and ones on a massive spreadsheet of thousands of people. Um, I ask myself how the research questions that uh, I'm looking at and the potential findings that they'll yield will impact the lives of the most vulnerable. And whether that will really help us achieve our ultimate goal of creating a more just um, because if it doesn't pass that test, if it's not work that really, truly matters, I think there's no point in pursuing it. And I hope that that's something um, you all will do as well as you continue to explore the myriad opportunities that are available here at Hopkins. You'll find there's so many things that you can do and activities that you can be a part of. Um, and I just hope that you are able to kind of make the best of that time. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions or, or ever want to chat again about Baltimore, <laughs> there's many of us. Apparently, we'll have to start a like little Baltimore club. Um, but I'm on the fourth floor as well, and you can find me in 4624. Thanks. My name is Asta, and uh, contrary to many of the people who have presented today, I am not from Baltimore. Uh, I am from Dar Slam in Tanzania. And uh, I think the main message that I wanted to give today was I have two beliefs as a public health professional. One is to do something that you're passionate about. And two is to walk the talk. And, I, and I'll tell you a story about that. So my passion for public health and social justice started from the streets of Dar es Salaam. As a child, uh, I would go to the hospital with my dad where he worked as a doctor and realized that life was not equal nor was it fair. I went into my undergraduate thinking I would become a doctor, but realized I wanted to make a difference at the population level. So during my third year of university, during my undergrad, I volunteered with the WHO in Tanzania to evaluate a condom uptake program amongst uh, commercial sex trade workers who were mostly adolescents. While I was interviewing them and conducting this survey, uh, it put into perspective that condom use was not an individual decision and rather a factor of social determinants of health, which is what most of the people today have talked about. Both my master's as well as my doctorate education solidified this, th uh, solidified this thinking. And currently my research focuses on gender and past adversities and how that affects violence during adolescence and hopefully eventually into adulthood. I have seen how power imbalances within the household and relationships leads to different forms of violence. And I know that because living and walking what my research is on has become a challenge when I gave birth four and a half years ago. As a mother, I tend to sometimes get impatient and tired of answering questions that my child asks. It is constantly a struggle to stop getting irritated about why tsunamis happen or why earthquake happens or why trees grow so tall. But I have taught, well, but I have taught him that he should keep me a check and when my tone changes. So now when I get irritated, he asks me to talk properly. So both these beliefs are based on few lessons I have learned. One, health is a human right. Two, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of a cure. Three, risk and protective factors from in vitro to adulthood all determine the individual health outcomes and every individual piece of work done to reduce the inequalities collectively makes a large change. Four, we all play a part in creating the change we want, but we have to start with ourselves first. And five, everyone is equal. So, I mostly work remotely, but I I would be I would be happy to meet with you um, if you email me. I would be happy to come. Um, I would be happy to come into campus. And if you're interested in the work I do, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Well, hello everyone, and for those, um, I think I met many of you in um, life course class. For those I haven't met. Um, my name is Xiaobi Wang. I direct the Center on Early Life Origins Disease. This is something I'm very passionate about and so glad to see all of you. Um, so in the next five minutes, 
I'm going to share with you what gives me inspiration, energy, and joy to come here every day. Talk about inspiration, first of all. Um, about 30 years ago, I was a student here, and I'm, I chose this department because I was inspired by the mission of this department. I was actually one of the first, among the one of the first international student of this department. Um, so over the years, and not only I learned so much, but I also witnessed how this department has grown tremendously and also the field, okay? It's become a much more influential and much bigger field when I then, as compared to when I started, what is meant? So you're in a growing field. So you want to be in a growing field, right? So the growing field means uh, it has not only um, has implications for maternal and child health, and now the work we do also has the implications for life long house, and you learn, <laughs> and also for the house of the generations to come. So that's my fundamental inspirations. And also for me, my inspiration also come from a project I did. It took on more than two decades ago and it's still ongoing. <laughs> that's <laughs> something I'm really passionate about. Okay, what is my project? Um, I'll tell you a little later. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so this is related to the DOHEP you heard about, developmental origin of house disease. But I wasn't thinking DOHEP 20 years ago. Actually, um, I only heard about it and don't know what it is and what to do. And But I think the idea is accumulating over time. First of all, when I was like you in the class, first in the class, and the, so I learned something about preterm low birth weight and what's the importance. So that was my first impression. Okay, low birth weight preterm are very important. And so they're important in many ways. So that was in my back of my mind, um, has that concept. Then later after graduation, I went to do my pediatric residency in Boston. So I did a several rotation in the NICU. So you see, in my head, I already had the impression of low birth weight preterm birth. And while I do my pediatric residency, I see my first hand, okay, I witnessed what preterm, what prematurity meant for the baby, for the family. And so that was really in, reinforced my interest in find out why and why there are so many preterm births, why black uh, children have such a high prevalence and what we can do about. Of course, as a pediatrician, my primary responsibility at that time was to take good care of the baby, but the since I was also trained here. Um, and uh, so my mother kept telling me, you need to do something in terms of prevention, in terms of how to prevent the preterm birth. So those are the driving inspirations for me. So what's next? I want to do something. But for any kind of research, you need funding. So. So how was the, I started to realize I need to look for funding. Okay. <laughs> I need the money to, to conduct research. So at that time, um, luckily, the March Dime uh, launched a major campaign, the national campaign. That was the, for the first time in the history of March Dime, they allocated big funding to support preterm research. So they issued our RFA, that's the call for research for application. So I applied. To my great surprise, because at that time I was a third year pediatric resident, I was selected <laughs> as one of the worthies. That was so thrill. That was the best day in my life. <laughs> and I was awarded the March time grant. So after that, so I finished my residency, I started the Boston birth over right away. That was in 1998. So the Boston birth course started, as you can imagine, from zero. So over the time I worked with my team, so we enrolled the mother baby one by one at the Boston, right at the Boston Medical Center. So it takes 20 years to grow to a size that's national significance. So now it's over 8,700 mother baby pairs 
and uh, that translate into 17,000, okay, 17,000 of them, not only the number, but also they have been followed over the past 20 years. So I can tell you a lot more later. And the, so the Bosnian who are so far has made important contribution to the science. But the work um, is more than, I think the project itself is more than just a scientific contribution. And I, for me, it's a source of a energy, inspiration, and also a source of joy. So why is, and uh, so when, when we after work with, like imagine in, when you're trying to figure out something, some questions, and then suddenly you discover something, that kind of thrill, the, the scientific discovery and inspired by your discovery. And it's that kind of a feeling, the thrill, and that's a source of joy. And the energy, the energy actually comes from the great teamwork. So you can imagine for such a project or times, it takes hundreds of them. So literally, I can testify. So this work actually takes hundreds of people's hard work. And uh, so it's not only from Hopkins, but also from multiple institutions that including the MIT, Harvard, and the Boston University, as well as uh, I was also in Northwestern. It's uh, many people's hard work, many people's wisdom, and many people's energy and their time put into it. But collectively, we made something that on the one hand, contribute to science. On the other hand, we contribute um, and also it's contributed the professional development and the many people involved. So over the years, we celebrate um, personal and professional, we call milestones, okay? <laughs> we have developmental milestones and they have their personal professional milestones. And the many of the trainees that range from master student, doctor student, and the postdocs and the, even the junior faculty, they uh, continue and succeed and become the leaders in medicine and the public health. So that's really the part of our pride and the joy and the also inspiration uh, out of this work. So um, to end, I hope I didn't take more than five minutes. Um, <laughs> so my take home message for the student here is um, you are, I would say in a growing and the promising field. I can promise you that. Um, and no matter what project you do, find something you're passionate and find something um, you enjoy and form a collaborative team. And I feel um, my big joy actually is working with my colleague across aisle. I enjoy working with people in this department I also collaborate with many people outside the department, and we learn from each other. And I think of our synergy actually come from the interaction of the multidisciplinaries, and and also enjoy the process. No matter it's challenging or it's opportunity, so enjoy it. And uh, so my best wishes for all of you for a successful new academic year. So uh, my door always open. Actually, I'm. My office is strategically located. <laughs> it's just across the elevator. And uh, so feel free to come. Okay. Hello. Um, nice to see you all. My name is Allison West, and I'm an assistant professor um, in Pop Fam. And I'm going to spend a few minutes today just telling you a little bit about my journey to Pop Fam. Um, so earlier this week, I found myself thinking a lot about where I was and who I was with um, when I first learned that the first plane hit the World Trade Center on September 11th. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that because where I was and who I was with, I get a little emotional, um, had a big impact on my path to public health. So in 2001, um, that fall, I was working across town in a school, in a high school, um, as a school social worker for youth with multiple complex learning and behavioral challenges. And that morning, I was in my office with a student, um, a 15-year-old student, um, and we were talking that day about the music that she loved, and she was a real um, lover of gospel music. 
And we had decided that day that at the end of our time together, we would spend about 15 minutes and she would share with me some gospel music, um, some of her favorites. And so that's what we did. So we turned on the radio and we turned the dial to her favorite gospel music station and she sang along. And it was wonderful. And joy, and love, and hope filled that room. And it was magical. And then we said goodbye and parted ways and we talked about when we would see each other again. So I turned down the radio and closed my office door, but I kept that radio on because I just wanted to sit with that hope and love a little longer. And that's when I heard about 30 seconds later that the plane hit the tower. So I want to circle back. So again, every year I find myself thinking a lot about the student. And so that's why I decided to talk about this today. I want to circle back and talk a little bit more about that student. So again, I was working in a school with children with multiple complex um, learning and behavioral challenges. And um, why was that student in that school? Well, first of all, that student was in that school because the regular public school system had failed to meet her needs um, and she was not able to be successful in that learning environment. Well, why was that? Well, that was because this student had some pretty severe emotional challenges and challenges with emotional regulation to the extent that it looked, what it looked like in practice was a lot of outbursts and sometimes aggressive outbursts amongst her peers and other you know, faculty within the school. Um, so that's why she was, she was in that school. Um, but then again, that wasn't really surprising because this was also a student who had already experienced six failed foster care placements. So she had been in six different foster homes over the course of her life. Why was she in foster homes? Well, probably due to the fact that did she, because she had been removed from her own home with her birth family due to severe abuse and neglect. So her story was a unique one, but there were certain things that were common among all of the students on my, on my caseload. Um, so what I learned very quickly um, was that every student on my caseload came from a family that had the cards stacked against them from the beginning. Um, all of the children and families with whom I worked had experienced from very early in the life course multiple structural challenges, oftentimes intergenerational trauma, um, economic circumstances that made it very difficult for their families to succeed. And what I also realized very quickly was that services and systems were not set up so that students like this could be successful. And perhaps even more importantly, that services and systems were not set up much earlier in her life course to help her family when they needed it most including when before she was removed from her home due to abuse and neglect. So um, after about 11 years working in direct services with families and before that having some, some other research roles, um, I had the wonderful opportunity to return to school to pursue a doctorate in social work, a research doctorate. And so I embraced that opportunity. Um, to learn more about social and structural determinants that influence the life force of children and families. Um, and then to take that knowledge that I learned and apply it um, to trying to do better for, for students like the one I described. Um, and that is what led me here. And so I am so happy to be here today working with all, all of our colleagues. There's a strong theme about children and families today, which really excites me. We have a wonderful faculty here. And as you've heard, we are very multidisciplinary, um, but I'm happy to talk to any of you and thank you for, for listening to my story. Hi everyone, I'm Shannon Wood. I'm an assistant scientist in the department. I'm doing a quick time check just to make sure that I don't keep you from going at all because I am the last, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, so, Many have touched on the Baltimore story today. I am not a Baltimorean, um, but it is the longest place I've lived so far. Um, but my early childhood experiences actually very much shaped my journey to public health. I moved around a lot as a kid. I lived internationally. My grandparents lived in Asia. And I was very drawn to um, how people communicated across cultures and languages. Um, I ultimately ended up in California for high school and then moved on to, um, to Texas for my undergraduate education, um, where I was a pre-med major. 
Um, I was very drawn to health, as many in public health are. Um, but I quickly learned that students, women particularly in Texas, had very different sex education than I had experienced in California. And so in communication and conversations with my new friends, I um, just started to learn a bit about regional disparities and was really drawn to this field of women's health. Um, at the time, I also started digging more into my science classes and started realizing that maybe this wasn't actually the right route for me. Um, so I had a, a wonderful professor um, who was really into research methods, and I started learning about research methods, mm -hmm. epidemiology. I was a medical humanities major, which was a very big major, but it allowed you to take a lot of different cool classes. Um, and in these conversations with my professor, I also learned that there was a trip to Kenya and that they were interested in exploring more about um, determinants of women's contraceptive use among this very um, small group in Western Kenya. So I went on the trip. I learned all about survey design before going, did a very basic knowledge, attitudes, and behavior survey. Um, interviewed about 200 women and just really fell in love with this process of um, survey design, interviewing, and also just the sexual and reproductive health field in general. But what I learned from this survey, um, in our five pages of questions, nothing was associated with contraceptive use except for um, past month experience of sexual violence. And so for me, this really set up um, this interesting um, knowledge base. And I, it led me to want to know more about violence in general. So I went off to London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, worked with their gender violence and health center there to learn as much as I could about violence and, and this intersection. Um, I, I took a few years off afterwards um, to, to work in the field and explore women's health more generally but I really just kept being drawn back to this intersection between violence and reproductive health. And so I came back here in 2015, I think, to do a PhD, um, really looking at um, this intersection. And my second year, I was working with Michelle Decker, um, and we, again, were interviewing women, um, this time, again, in Kenya, this time in Nairobi, um, but we started hearing about their experiences um, surrounding um, forced impregnation. So really specifically reproductive coercion, then not wanting to become pregnant, but feeling forced, pressured, um, and explicitly in some cases, um, experiences of sexual violence. And so this very much set me up on a trajectory for digging into reproductive coercion. That was what all my dissertation research was on. And now I um, very much lead research surrounding reproductive coercion measurement, and we're moving also into the intervention space. So that is a bit um, what leads me to the store. And it's very fun to actually circle back to those stories and, and think about how everything's built on each other over the years. Um, okay, time check, we're doing great. Um, thank you all. <laughs> for being here and um, stop by anytime. So thanks so much, uh, everyone, for being here. You've met some of our faculty. There are many more. Our doors are always open. A special thank you to Sylvia and to Dina for making this possible and to all for joining us online. And we're really excited about the year ahead and look forward to learning with you. Thanks so much.